morning, Lord. Anyway, um, we want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook. God bless you. Linda up in Maine and uh, anyone else who's in with maybe Sajiv up in India. God bless you, my son. We love you. We praise God for your life and what you're doing in India. And uh, we want to just thank God for uh, Masha King. She was in the hospital overnight. Uh, one of my uh, friends on Facebook and... Uh, she really loves our ministry. She's originally from New England area, but she moved to Florida, and she's uh, been down there for a few years now. And uh, she got somehow we got connected uh, with the Pakistan Church, which uh, we're no longer supporting. We're breaking away from them. We'll get into more detail of that later on. But um, but we got to meet through through that circumstance. And uh, she loves our ministry. Uh, really, really is encouraging. Uh, loves to listen on Sunday morning uh, when she's not in church. Uh, you know, when we, we put it on the Facebook on, on the Facebook and so forth. So uh, we thank God for her and that she's okay. She uh, had some pain in her chest, but she's fine. So praise God for that. Uh, we want to uh, also lift up Darren in prayer. You know, he's uh, going through a rough time right now. We just want to keep him in prayer. And uh, we know that God has got his hand on him. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, we're going to be studying tonight from uh, the, uh, on hermeneutics again. We're going to get back into that so we can finish up this chapter. Uh, we still have the uh, certificates for the Book of Acts. We haven't got that signed off yet. I'm waiting for my wife to sign off on those. And, and when she does, we'll hand them out again, maybe next Wednesday. You can sign off on them in the bottom. They're on the computer, my little file there. So i got to remind you, I can tell. She's got a smile on her face. You know, she's she just smiling at me. She I'll get you later. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, we're going to be talking tonight about covenantal principles. Covenantal principles. Last, the last time we were together, we talked on the election. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, chapter 12 in your book. Okay, I do have water. Good. Father, we just ask that you bless your study tonight. Father, we give you the praise, the honor, and the glory, and we, we just thank you for truth. We thank you that your Holy Spirit is real and that he leads and guides us into all truth. Help us, Lord, to not have any preconceived ideas, but we lean totally upon you, Father. Lord, you will teach us in the way that we should go. That's what your word says, and we believe it. So, Father, I pray that you anoint me to share your word tonight. I thank you for the privilege and the honor to be able to do this in your name. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. The covenantal principle, <clears throat> talking about hermeneutics. You don't hear too much about this in churches today. They don't teach this stuff. You go and it's all hype and hallabaloo and all that stuff, and they go and they leave on a cloud nine only to fall down to a pit, and they sometimes don't rise out. Teaching is very important, and we believe that in this ministry. And so we're teaching hermeneutics on how to interpret the Bible, how to properly in interpret the Bible, and, uh, and how to uh, be able to come up with a right interpretation. What is the covenantal principle of biblical interpretation? What is it? Well, it's the covenant principle of biblical interpretation is the principle by which the interpretation of a verse or a group of verses is determined by the uh, consideration of its covenantal setting. A covenant, what is that? A covenant is a formal, uh, solemn, and binding agreement or contract usually under seal between two or more parties. That's what a covenant is. Uh, you know, we have a marriage covenant. We have different other covenants we'll get into. So the word covenant, what does it mean? What does the word covenant mean? The word covenant means a cutting, and it refers to the process of, it, of formalizing an agreement of the principal parties between uh, uh, parties passing between pieces of flesh. And we're going to look at that. When you look at this, uh, this, this uh, covenant agreement, and you're going to find that in Genesis 15, verses 17 and 18. And Jeremiah 34, 18 and 19. And we're going to look at those right now. So if you could put up Genesis 15, 17 to 18. He's already got it up there. He's a little faster than me. 
<clears throat> Excuse me. And it says, And it came to pass, when the sun went down and it was dark, that, behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your descendants have I given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Now, I want to go back to that again because I want to look at that from, a, from the beginning of a few scriptures above that. So look at uh, Genesis 15, and we're going to look at because some of you don't, probably don't know what that's talking about. Let's see, where are we? Okay. Okay, verse 9. Uh, let's go to verse 8. He says, and he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? God was telling him about the land. He made a covenant agreement. <clears throat> now, let me just interject this for a moment while it's on my mind, because I'll forget probably later on. There's two kinds of, uh, well, there's different covenants, but there's two aspects to the covenant. Number one, what's called a bilateral covenant. Anybody know what that means? A bilateral covenant means it's between one or two, it's between two or three persons or more. It's bilateral, it's, it's with two or more. A unilateral covenant is with one, when one makes the covenant and is not dependent upon the other or what the other person does. So look at verse 8. And he said, Lord, whereby shall I know that it shall, I shall inherit it? <clears throat> now, this covenant that, Abraham, that God is making with Abraham this is called a unilateral covenant. In other words, God is making this covenant with Abraham, and it doesn't matter what Abraham does. It's a promise that God has given to him that his seed, and notice the word seed is singular, it's not plural. So it's not his natural descendants, but it's the seed that's going to come, and that seed, I think it's in Galatians, says it is Christ. So it's talking about a personal Messiah coming through his seed, and so uh, he says here, How shall I know that I'll inherit? And he said unto him, Take you a heifer of three years old, and a sheep goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst. In other words, he cut them in half. And laid each piece out, once again another, but the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down on the carcass, Abraham drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham. And lo, a horror of great darkness fell on him. And he said to Abraham, Know for surety that the seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that the nation whom they shall serve I will judge afterward, and they shall come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, that thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet fulfilled, uh, not full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp had passed between those two pieces. Now, if you look at the pieces, and what tradition would tell, would tell us is that when they did that, they would make like a figure eight. And he would walk in between the pieces, and he would say something on this manner, may this death happen to me if I break this covenant. So God was swearing by none other than himself and saying, this covenant will not be broken. This covenant is an assured thing, and it will come to pass. And how many know that it has? Amen. Who's the seed? Christ. He came. So that promise is fulfilled. Hallelujah. Praise the Am I the one getting excited about this? I don't know. You're all just, you know. Uh, come on now. All right. So let's look at this. The word covenant in the Greek. Uh, let me back up for a moment. Let's look at Jeremiah 34, 18 and 19. 
He says, and I will give the man, the men who have transgressed my covenant, who have not performed the words of the covenant which they made before me, when they cut the calf in two and passed between the parts of it, the princes of Judah, the princes of Jerusalem, the eunuchs, the priests, and all the people of the land who passed between the parts of the calf. And I will give the men who have transgressed my covenant. In other words, they sinned against the covenant. They didn't keep their part of the bargain. So that would be a bilateral covenant. So you have to know these things when you're looking at the Bible to interpret them properly. And also, when you're looking at Scripture, to know the different covenants that were made throughout history so you know how to deal with the interpretation for that period of time. Very important. So the word uh, covenant in the Greek means a disposition of our arrangement of any sort which one wishes to be valid. And it can refer to a testament or will which deals with the last dispos uh, uh, disposition which one makes of his earthly possessions after his death. They call it a, a new, uh, your will is, the, the, the will is your, your last testament or your last covenant that you make on earth. That's the last agreement. And if no one can, no one can, can do anything about that, that's in your will. It's, it's a certified will. It's been witnessed. It's been notarized. Uh, it's been signed by witnesses that you are in your right mind when you wrote that will. And whatever your last wishes are and you make that covenant, it has to stand with that. <coughs> Excuse me. It can refer to a, a binding compact agreement or covenant, and you can see that in Ezekiel 20, verse 37. You don't have to go there, but I'll read it. I will make you pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. That's in uh, Ezekiel 20, verse 37. God himself has entered into many covenants with man. Do you believe that? He has. So what are the kinds of covenants that God has made with man? Well, there are two principal types of covenants that God has made with man, and we talked a little bit about them. There are the conditional covenants, which is a conditional upon what you and I do. God says, I will do this if you fulfill this. I'll do this if you fulfill that. So a conditional covenant is a covenant that has conditions attached to it. It is a covenant that can be broken by either party when the conditions attached to the covenant are not met by one of the other parties. A conditional covenant as it relates to God is a covenant in which God obligates himself, hear me now, God obligates himself to fulfill it or to fulfill the promises of the covenant only upon man's obedience to the conditions set forth by God. And you'll see that all through the Old Testament. Different covenants that God made, it was um, based on conditional um, um, promises of how the person reacted. So the operative words in a conditional covenant are, if you will, then I will. Look at Exodus 19, verse 5 to 6. That's the first example we're going to look at. Exodus 19, verse 5 to 6. Now, therefore, if, what's that word, if? It's a conditional, right? It's conditional. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my, what? My agreement with you. Right? Then what will, what will happen? It says, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all the people. Isn't that great? Now, the reason why some people aren't a, a, a peculiar treasure unto the Lord is because they're not obeying his voice. And they're not keeping the covenant. Those are very things that are important. And also remember now, in this covenant, he's talking to the house of Israel and Judah. Okay? So keep that in the back of your mind also. Then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all the people, for all the earth is the devil's. Hmm? All the earth is mine, he said. God speaking there. The earth belongs to God. 
the devil usurps authority and take, tries to take authority. And the only reason why he has authority is the church is not rising up with the power and the covenant that they have with God to withstand against the enemy's foe and to destroy the enemy's tactics. You know, to talk about uh, these young people are out there in the streets by the hundreds of thousands and they're protesting about guns. Well, before the school shooting, where were they? There was other shootings. If they really cared, where, where, where were they? Oh, I see. It didn't affect them till it was them. And now everybody's up. And now everybody's up there, and everybody's out there blaming guns and, blame, and trying to change laws for a law-abiding citizen. See, but the problem isn't that. It's because the church has not lived up to its covenant. In other words, God made a covenant with with, with the disciples, right? What did he tell the disciples? He made a covenant with them. Go into all the world and preach the gospel, right? And he said, Lord, I am with you always. Preach the word. Heal the sick. Cleanse the leper. Raise the dead. Cast out devils. Freely you have been given. Freely I have given. Freely you have received. Freely give. Go do it. That's a covenant. That God, Jesus said, I'm going to be with you, and I'll be, I'll be with you to perform these miracles. Just go do it. So it's a, it's a bilateral covenant. It's an agreement. And he says, you go out there and do this. I'm going to be with you. And I'll do, what, I'll do my part if you do your part. Okay? But what happens? We go out and we're not, we're not faith. We, you know, we don't have faith. We're not believing the covenant that he, what he said. And so things don't happen. But they happen in other parts of the world. They're happening in Brazil. They're happening in, in Africa. They're happening in India. Miracles are being taken place. Why? Because they believe, and they're, they're out doing what they're supposed to be doing. So he says, but you are a peculiar people because you are mine. <clears throat> and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So he's giving them instruction. He's telling them, look, if you obey my voice and you, do my, and you obey my covenant, this is what's going to happen to your nation. You're going to be a peculiar people. <clears throat> you're, you're going to be able to do things that people are going to scratch their heads and say, how could that be done? And if you look at Israel today, you go through the land of Israel and you see in a desert, in a desert, fruitfulness. Then I think they're the number one export for, for uh, what is it, honey? Uh, avocados. And they came up with an engineering idea of how to irrigate the desert. It's amazing. And people are scratching their heads and wondering, how did they do that? How can that little nation do that? Amen. So Israel as a nation did not fulfill all of those conditions associated with the promise, and so the promise was extended to another. Now, that doesn't mean that God has forsaken Israel, because there is a remnant, amen? But now he's chosen another nation, and it's God's kingdom. And it's, the kingdom is not of this world. It's not a nation of this world. But the church is supposed to be a peculiar people, a holy what? Nation. And we're to represent, we're supposed to be the representatives or the ambassadors, if you will, of this kingdom. Matthew 21, verse 43 says, Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation, bearing the fruits of it. <clears throat> now, that doesn't mean that God has forsaken that covenant agreement. God is still going to keep that covenant agreement with the remnant during the tribulation period. When those uh, Israelites accept Christ, he's going to restore them and bring them back in and graft them in again. Amen? Example two, and he said, and he said uh, this is Exodus 15, 26, and said, if you diligently, Exodus 15, 26, 
And he said, if thou will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and will do that which is right in his sight and will give ear to his commandments. <coughs> now, what does that mean? Just to give ear. What does that mean? That doesn't mean just to listen. Okay. Yeah, it does. But there's a process to that. Okay. When you give your ear to the commandment, you, what you're doing is you're hearing the commandment, you're processing that commandment, asking God to deal with things in your life that you may be guilty of in that commandment so that you can fulfill that commandment in your heart and in your life. So listening isn't just hearing and then walking out and forgetting it. You know? Like if, if I met you in the parking lot after Sunday morning and I said, okay, what was the title of my message? Oh, gee, uh, I forgot. <laughs> How can you forget? It's only been 20 minutes. Okay. Or oh, what was my message about? Uh, you follow what I'm saying? So listening is not just the pro, not just a, a hear. Uh, okay, you're hearing information going in. No, there's a process to hearing. There's a process to uh, to hearing what you're saying and say, okay, Lord, I'm hearing this, but Lord, examine my heart to see what I'm hearing in the areas that it's not being fulfilled, and show me why. Show me what you need to do. <coughs> Amen? Okay, so let's read the rest of it. And give ear to his commandments, and keep all of his statues. Now, that doesn't mean go home and make statues. Okay? Those are ordinances. They're not, they're not real life molding statues. Okay, it doesn't mean that. So people say, see, there's statues in the Bible. No, there's not. He says, look what he says. Keep all the statues. I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians. If I am the Lord, that what? Healeth thee. So what's the instruction? God says, I will, I will, I will not do this if you do this. If you will diligently... That word diligently is not something taken lightly. How many have ever lost your keys? How many have ever lost something of value in your home? You might have put it somewhere and you, and you don't know where it is, right? What happens? You begin to get frantic. You begin to, you begin to diligently look for that thing. You're looking high and low under things, things that you haven't taken out for years. You're going all over the place trying to find diligently seeking that thing or whatever it was and finding it. And through your diligence, guess what? You find it. You know? I remember one time I was diligently looking for my glasses. I had, had my glasses. I was doing some reading. The phone rang or something like that. And I answered the phone, and then all of a sudden, I'm looking for my glasses. Where are they? I put my glasses somewhere. I can't find my glasses. I go in the bathroom. I go downstairs. I go upstairs. I look in the bedroom. I look all over the place until I pass the mirror and I looked in the mirror. <laughs> and there those little guys were, right up there, all that time. I'm telling you, be diligent, he says. If you diligently hearken to the voice, so this is a bilateral covenant. If you do this, then I will put none of these diseases upon you, which I have brought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord that healeth you. Can somebody give a good amen? Now compare Deuteronomy 28. Uh, let me see. Verse, I think it's verse 58. Is it Deuteronomy 28, 58? Let me get a little bit of water here. Oh, thank you. He says, again, what? If thou will not observe 
To what? See, let me say about the, the new Christianity out there. The new Christianity out there says that you don't have to do a thing. There's nothing you can do. It's all by grace. You just accept Jesus as your Savior and you're all set. That's all you have to do. That's it. No, that's not all it. There's still covenant agreements that God has that he wants to impart to us for, for, to better life, for a better life. Okay? <clears throat> He said, if thou wilt not observe to do all the words that are of this law that are written in this book, that thou mayest fear this glorious and fearful name, the Lord Jehovah thy God. Now verse 59. Then the Lord will make thy plagues wonderful, and the plagues of thy seed generational, Sickness, even great plagues and of long continuance, and sore sicknesses of long continuance. Now, I'm not saying that's for us today. What I'm saying to you is that that was given to Israel, okay? Because the Bible says, in Galatians, I believe, that anyone who hangs on the cross was cursed. And that Christ became a curse for us. And because, oh, I don't want to give up my Sunday sermon, but because Christ did that, this is no longer in effect for us. Hallelujah. We'll get into that Sunday. I don't want to, get in, I don't want to spoil it. <clears throat> now, there are unconditional covenants also. We're going to talk about that. Those were bilateral. Those were conditional. If you will, if you do this, then I'll do this. If you don't do this, then I will do this. Follow me? So there are now unconditional covenants, and the unconditional covenant is a covenant that has no conditions attached to it. No if, ands, or buts. It is a covenant where the principal party involved makes promises that are not dependent on anything but the integrity of the person making those promises. So in other words, God. So look at Titus 1 and 2. One, I'm sorry, Titus verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. Okay, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie. This is something that you have to grab a hold of, and I have to grab a hold of, and understand that God does not lie. And when you understand that, and you read the word, and he says, listen, don't do that because this will happen. Don't begin to reason with yourself and say, oh, no, that will never happen to me. And go out and do that dumb thing, and guess what? And then it happens, and now you're in a dilemma. God doesn't lie. If he says, whatsoever, whatsoever a man sows, that shall he reap. If you sow to the flesh corruption, you're going to reap corruption. If you sow of the Spirit, you'll reap Spirit everlasting life. You follow me? That's a principle that God tells you the truth. And he says, this will happen. And see, this is where people don't get it. That's why some people struggle so much. And they go through difficulties in their life. Because number one, they're stubborn. They won't listen to the Word of God. They won't listen to correction. They will not listen to instruction. Same as the Israelites. And all they have to do is go and read their Bible and see from the Israelites, those things happen to them for an example. When you go back and look at all the disobedience that they did and what they went through, you go, holy cow, I don't want to go through that. <clears throat> it should motivate us to do even better things or, or be obedient to the Lord. An unconditional covenant as it relates to God is a covenant which God obligates himself to fulfill the promises of that covenant regardless of man's response. 
The operative words in an unconditional covenant are, I will. So we're going to look at one. Genesis 9, verse 8 to 16. And remember, you have to understand that the covenant principle of interpretation <coughs> will save you a lot of trouble in your Christian walk in thinking, well, if I, if, I, if I just do one bad thing, God's going to put diseases on me. No, that's not what he's saying. Well, You've got to interpret that in the covenant that it was, it was originally given and not that's why a lot of people have this mentality of God, that God is up there with a big stick, ready and willing to hit anybody over the head. That's not the truth. That's not what God does. God is not up there to, 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 to uh, hit you over the head. Okay, your own decisions will hit you over the head. Okay, whatsoever a man sows, that's what he reaps. So God is, is, is kind of like out of the equation on that because it's all up to you. It's what you do. Amen? Hallelujah. God's not going to put a curse on you. He loves you. You're his child. Think about that. How, would you put a curse on your child? No. In fact, Jesus, God did just the opposite. He allowed a curse to come on his son so that you and I could be free. See, I told somebody this the other day. And I think I said this on, uh, a couple of Sundays ago. When you realize how much God has done for you, then you, won't, you will do anything for God. When you and I realize what God has done for us, then we'll do anything for God. You want me to do this, God? You want me to give this up? No problem, God. It's gone. Because you, I love you for what you've done for me. You've died for me. You suffered for me. You were crucified for me. You forgave me. I was on my way to hell, and you, you forgave me. And you restored me back to the Father so I can have a relationship with my God. Thank you, Jesus, for what you have done. Now, God, I'll do anything for you. A wife will do anything for her husband if her husband responds to her in love. If he takes care of her, if he nourishes her. Right? Amen. So let's look, okay, Genesis 9, verse 8. And God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, and I, behold, I establish my covenant with you. Look, what he, look at these words, okay? He says, and I, not we, I, behold, I establish my covenant, my agreement with you and with your seed after you. Next verse. And with... Every living creature that is with you, of the fowl of the cattle and of the beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. Next verse. And I, I will establish my covenant, my agreement with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of of a flood. Stop for a moment. What God is saying here is, no longer will I be angry and take vengeance like I took, okay, in flooding and destroying all of humanity. Because that's what God did. So it says it was in the days of Noah, violence. God's not going to destroy the whole thing until the redemptive purpose is done, and then he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth where the old earth or the old world will be burnt up. We understand that. He said, neither shall... No, go back, go back, go back. I've got to finish. He said, neither shall there be any flood to destroy the earth. God will never destroy... I don't care what the uh, scientists say, oh, the North Pole's melting and we're going to have another ice age and you know, everything's going to melt and we're all going to be flooded. I've heard more arguments about the ice caps melting and the flooding that's going to take place 
but I've never heard one of them talk about the process of evaporation. You know how many billions, not millions, how many billions of gallons of water evaporate from the earth every single day? I researched it. Go look. You'll be amazed. You'll be amazed. And it's not climate problems, whatever they call it, they, you know, climate change. That's not what's doing it. Global warming, that's not what's doing it. Next verse. And God said, this is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you. And every living creature that is with you for perpetual, I want you to check this out now, for perpetual generations. I'll keep stay on that scripture a minute. For perpetual generations. Generation after 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 generation until it comes to our generation. How do we prove that? How do we today in our lives prove that covenant to be true? Watch this. Next verse. I do set my bow in the cloud. That's not the gay and lesbian rainbow. That's, that, that's not what that is. They took that as their symbol. But that only makes them more accountable to God and his covenant. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. How many have ever seen a rainbow? Do you think of, I want you to think about this a moment. When you see a rainbow, you are witnessing a covenant agreement that God made over 5,000 years ago to Noah when he set that bow in the heavens. Next verse. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. You and I are witnesses. We're witnesses. To the, you know, people say, God, you prove there's a God. Well, I, I give this, I offer this as proof. You and I and all the generations that he said would happen, generation after generation after generation, shall see my sign that I put, I put in the clouds. And it's the rainbow. Hallelujah. Woo. Next verse. He says, and I will, not that God forgets, he doesn't have Alzheimer's. He doesn't have dementia. What he's, what he, when you see phrases like that, and I will remember, it's just to let you know that he doesn't forget. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and all the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all the flesh. One more verse, 16. <coughs> And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting, that word everlasting means eternal, covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. Wow. And every rainbow that, sh that shines... It's reflected in heaven above the throne. Read it in Revelation about the rainbow. It's above the throne of God when he sees that. That rainbow is constantly reminding God of the everlasting covenant between God 
and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. The Bible talks about even nature itself shows forth the very beauty and presence of who God is. If people would just understand that that, that rainbow thing is not for what people make it out to be, but the real rainbow that is in the cloud is a sign that God has given us to mankind to reveal that there is a God. In Genesis 12, verses 2 to 3, he says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And all and in you, all the families of the earth shall be. Be blessed. Why is it so important? It's important because as you interpret the Bible, especially the Old Testament, you must deal with the conditional covenant differently than you do with the unconditional covenant. <clears throat> okay. Um, what are the, I'm almost done. <coughs> what are the principal covenants that God made with man? We're not going to get into these covenants, but I'm going to give them to you. And these are nine principal covenants that God has made with man. And these will not be treated in this course that we're studying. We're not going to go into them. That's not what we're doing. I want to show you how important it is in interpreting the scriptures in the particular covenant that is spoken. So uh, if you want that, the same author, I believe, that wrote this book. Let me see if I get that right. Yeah, Kevin Malman. Malman. Kevin Malman, or Kevin Corner, wrote a book on the covenants. Like, just like this book. If you, you li you, how many like this book? You've been reading it? Uh, I've seen a couple of heads nodding. Well, you have a book to read it. You should be reading this, studying this. This is great stuff. We are not getting in, in depth of this, but you can read this book and study it. It's, it's really good stuff. But here's the, the nine different covenants that God has made with man. <clears throat> now, I'll give you the scripture reference to it. Okay, number one is the everlasting covenant. You found that in Hebrews 13, verse 20 to 21. I'll repeat that again. Number one is the everlasting covenant, and that's Hebrews 13, 20 to 21. <clears throat> and you have that in your book also. Okay. Um, you have the Edenic covenant in Genesis 1, 26 to 30. That's what the, the God made a covenant in, in the Garden of Eden. You have the Adamic covenant. You find that in Genesis 3, 1 to 24. Then the one we just talked about, you have the Noadic covenant, that God made a covenant with, it, with Noah. And then, uh, fifthly, you have the Abrahamic covenant, which you find in Genesis 12, 3, verse 15, 17, and 22. Seventh, you have... I'm sorry, six. Yeah, six, you have the Mosaic Covenant. You find that in Exodus chapters 20 to 40. And then seventh, you have the Palestinian Covenant. That's found in Deuteronomy chapters 27 to chapter 30. And then you have the Davidic Covenant, the covenant that God made with David. <clears throat> and that's in 2 Samuel 7, chapter 7, verse 4 to 29, and Psalm 89. The Davidic covenant is 2 Samuel 7, 4 to 29, verse 29, and Psalm 89. And then the final covenant, the new covenant, you'll see that in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. The new covenant, Jeremiah 31 to 30, uh, 31, chapter 31, verse 31 to 34, and Matthew uh, chapter 26, verse 26 to 29, Matthew 26, 26 to 29, in Hebrews uh, chapter 8 and 9. Why are these distinctions so important? It's in order to interpret the passages properly. It, it is important to be aware of the covenant that is in play in the passage. Always remember that. What covenant was taking place in that passage? You have questions, sweetie? Okay, I'll go over them one more time. Number one is the everlasting covenant. That's Hebrews 13, 20 to 21. The second one is the Edenic, or, or Eden, 
Eden, from the Garden of Eden, Edenic, E-D-E-N-I-C covenant. That's Genesis 1, 26 to 30. The third one is the Adamic covenant, how God made a covenant in, to Adam in Genesis 3, 1 to 24. The Noadic covenant is Genesis 8, uh, chapter 8 and 9. Uh, the Abrahamic covenant is Genesis 12, verses 3, verse 15, verse 17, and verse 22. Then you have the Mosaic covenant, which is Exodus chapters 20 to 40. Then you have the Palestinian covenant in Deuteronomy 27, um, Deuteronomy chapter 27 to chapter 30. You have the Davidic covenant of David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 4 to 29, and Psalm 89. And then you have the new covenant, which is Jeremiah 31, chapter 31, verse 31 to 34, Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 to 29, and Hebrews chapter 8 and 9. And remember, it's, it's important to interpret the passage properly because you want to be aware of the covenant that is in play during that time you're, of that particular passage you're reading. If you look at, there are principal elements in the divine covenants. In other words, God covenants. In God's covenants, there's promises, sacrifice, a seal or a sign, a feast, and a sanctuary in some, some form or fashion. We saw that in the, the Noadic Covenant. We saw the promise that I will never again destroy the earth again. For the sacrifice of blood, Noah offered a sacrifice. Remember, after the flood, he got out of the boat, and he took, a, he took the animal, and he made a sacrifice. The sign of the seal, God set the rainbow in the clouds. The feast, there's not one specifically mentioned here. Okay, Some... Commentators say that was probably the first time they ate meat, but I don't believe that was the case. The reason why is when God slew the animal with Adam and uh, Eve and took the skin of that, I don't think they let the flesh rot. I think they took that flesh and they ate it. Okay. That's a, that's a presum presumption on my part, but I don't believe that, you know, because they were banned from the garden, so they couldn't eat the fruits of the garden. And so we don't know. It's not... I'm not bound by that, but I just, this is my theory, that when God killed that animal, well, what a waste it would be just to let the animal's carcass die. You know, just eat it. They, they use it as a sacrifice, right? They burnt as a burnt, and the high priest and the priest also, also ate of the offerings. So that's where I get that from. So anyway, you don't have to believe that if you don't want to. <clears throat> and then the second example we want to look at is, uh, oh, let me go on. The, the last one was the, we had the feast and then the sanctuary. Uh, where he, the cleansed new earth would be the place where the covenant would now be fulfilled. So that was like a sanctuary. God was starting things over. The new covenant promises. Okay, When God made a promise, he said, I'll give you a new heart and I'll put a new spirit within you. You see that in Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Gospel of John. Then you see the sacrifice of the blood, which was Christ's blood was shed to ratify the covenant. Uh, Jesus said this cup is, is the new covenant, a new covenant. Uh, uh, agreement in my blood, which is shed for you. You see that in the uh, Luke Luke twenty two twenty. What was the seal? The seal was the Holy Spirit within. Ephesians one thirteen to fourteen says this: In whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. The feast we celebrate as Christians is the celebration of communion. And the sanctuary, the, the church, which is you and I, the temple of the living God. He has a new sanctuary. Before God dwelt outside of people in the temple. <coughs> now, collectively, if you read the Bible in Corinthians, it says, ye are the temple of God. Don't defile the temple. Well, that word ye is plural. It's not singular. So one person doesn't make up the temple. Some people think that. You know, I, I don't believe that. But we all make up the temple. It says that we're all lively stones built together, the foundation, of Christ being the chief cornerstone. So we're built up together. 
as live, living stones, the Bible says. So we become the sanctuary of God. How does one use the covenantal principle in interpretation? When studying a passage in Scripture, it is important to know the covenant format of the Bible. Which covenant was in effect at a certain time? How did that covenant affect the lives of the people? How do these covenants relate to each other? And this is the key to unlocking many passages. Determine if the passage has covenantal language. Not all passages will qualify. Where there is no covenant language, this principle of interpretation does not apply. So it doesn't apply everywhere. Determine which covenant or covenants are involved. <clears throat> Determine whether or not the covenant is conditional or unconditional. Determine whether this covenant is fulfilled in the new covenant. Very important. Find out if this has been fulfilled. That's why, you know, if you look at, at people that are so excited about Israel building the temple. Okay? I get excited about the temple being built only because it's, it's, it's bringing closer to the time of Jesus' return. That's what I get excited about. But people are excited. They say, they're going to bring back the Ark of the Covenant. And everybody's all, ooh, the Ark of the Covenant. Ooh, 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 the Ark of the Covenant. God's presence is going to be on the Ark of the Covenant. No, it's not. Hate to bust your bubble, but it's not going to be on the Ark of the Covenant. It used to be. Okay? It used to be. The Bible says we know that God does not dwell in temples made with hands. Where does God dwell? Where is the Ark of the Covenant? Inside of you. Come on, somebody. It was made of wood overlaid with gold. Humanity, okay, in symbolism. Wood is symbolic of humanity. He dwells in us. Amen? Think about that. Think about that. God, think about this. God, you know who I'm talking about now, right? God dwells in you. If so be that the Spirit of Christ dwells in you, the Bible says. If any man that hath not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If you realize that, that doesn't make you a God, doesn't make you a little God, as some have er erroneously taught, Just means that you're a bearer of the presence of God. And can I tell you, the more that you and I die to the flesh, the more he lives in us. He cannot live fully through us unless we're willing to die thoroughly for him. That's why Paul says, it is no longer I that live it. But Christ lives in me. What does that mean? It means that not my will, but thy will be done. It means, Lord, crush my will. Take what I want out of my life. I want to live the will of God. I want to live the will of Christ. What does he have for me? What is my gifts? What are my talents? What does he have for me to do? And whatever he does, and he, however he wants to use you, that's why when, you, when God wants to use you, don't quench the spirit. Let God use you. Hallelujah. I don't care. I remember one time Tom got up and just ran all through the altar. I ran all through the, the church. The Spirit of God just moved him. I said, wow, well, praise God. I hope it happens again. Yeah. Well, be open. It might. It, no, no, it won't, won't. might. It will. Okay. God wants to use you. All you have to do is be willing to be open and say, Lord, put me aside. Put me aside. Let me just finish this up. What are some of the examples of the covenant principle? The following examples are taken from uh, the same book that we're taking this from. The Edenic Covenant. 
Uh, we see that in Revelation. It says, To him that overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. That's in Revelation. Okay? How do we interpret that? Remember, a long time ago, we talked about what? The principle of first mention. Go back and read it in, in Genesis about the tree of life. Okay? What does he say here? Revelation 2 7. To him that overcomes, put, up, put that up there, Revelation 2 7. To he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that what? Okay, this is, this is a bilateral covenant. It's conditional on you being an overcomer, not an underachiever. An overcomer. An overcomer of what? You ever ask that question? What are you an overcomer of? What's the one thing that's the hardest thing to become an overcomer over? Your flesh. <laughs> but to he that is an overcomer, will I give to eat of the... You're going to be able to partake of the very thing that Adam gave up. I don't know if you get excited about that, but I do. Because once you eat of that tree of life, you're sealed forever. That's why God had to put an angel with a flaming sword in the garden. Because he says, man has now become like one of us. And if they eat of the tree of, the, of, of, of the tree of life, they'll live forever, like in that fallen state. Praise God. And we're going to get to eat of the tree of life again. How many want to be an overcomer? Come on. You want to be an overcomer? The Adamic covenant, look at uh, Romans chapter 16, verse 20. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. In order to understand the full implication of this verse, it must be considered in the light of the Adamic covenant. After the entrance of sin into the human race, God said to the serpent, I will put enmity, enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This verse in Romans points to the ultimate fulfillment of the prophetic word of the Adamic covenant. This verse draws its significance from the fact that it is reiterated of the first messianic promise of redemption. Hallelujah. The Noahic covenant, we talked about that. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, a rainbow resembling the emerald, encircled the throne. That's in Revelation 4.3. And this must be interpreted with the Noahic covenant. I'm just going to go quickly so I can finish. The Abrahamic covenant. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. Again, how do we interpret that? Look at the uh, structure of that verse. How is, it, how is it formulated? He says, go back, go, go to this verse right here uh, I just mentioned. Uh, where is it? Uh, Galatians 3.29. <coughs> I'm just going to take a few minutes extra tonight so I can finish this. I don't want to leave off like two little sections. And if you be Christ, how many are Christ? Not that you're Jesus Christ. It doesn't say that. See, some people read that and say, if ye, if ye then be Christ. See, I'm Christ. No, you're not Christ. Sit down. Okay. It means if you belong to him. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's... Notice it doesn't say seeds. You cannot claim you're Jewish of a Hebrew descent. You're not. You're a Gentile. You will always will be a Gentile. Hello. If you were of Abraham's seeds, then you could claim your Jewishness. There are some Christians that are claiming that they're Jewish now because, no, you're not Jewish. You're Gentile. You'll always be a Gentile. Okay? But he says, to Abraham's seed. Then I eat Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. But how did I become a part of Abraham's seed through Christ. Hello? It's because of Christ. 
right? He said, and, and he said to Abraham, and in thy seed, not in all the seeds, he said, but in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. That's singular. Speaking of Christ, Jesus. And then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What was the promise? Of the Messiah. Come on, somebody. Get excited about I get excited about that. Then a Mosaic covenant. Colossians 2, 16 to verse 17. So let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. The subject matter of this verse can only be understood in relating to the Mosaic covenant. If you look at the covenant un, uh, under this, Israel was commanded to observe Sabbath days, festival, months, times of convocation, Sabbaths, and jubilee years. You find that in Leviticus 23 and 25. In Galatians, Paul is referring back to those observances belonging to the law covenant. And for the Colossians, believers who lived under the new covenant, keeping these observances would have been reverting back and placing themselves back under the Mosaic covenant. He said, but these things which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. You don't have to keep Sabbaths, new moons, festivals, all of those things. I keep telling you that. You see some churches today, they're going Jewish. You know, they've got the, they got the, um, the shawls and they've got the, the, uh, the horns and all that stuff. <coughs> and they've got the... Uh, the, the uh, What's that candles with the candles? What is it called? The menorah. The menorah. They got the menorah. You know, they got the little Ark of the Covenant in their church. You know, they got all that stuff thinking that that traditional stuff is going to bring the presence of God. That don't bring the presence of God. What brings the, what brings the presence of God into a church in, in, in a powerful way is the covenant agreement that the church enters into with God. If you obey my voice, if you hold up my commandments and obey all my statutes, then you'll be a holy nation, a peculiar people. Hallelujah. Then God's presence comes in that place. Wham! When you come into church, if you understand that and realize that when you come in, leave everything outside the camp. Okay? If you look at the tabernacle, they had outside the campus where they put all the garbage, all the junk, okay? When you come into the tabernacle, leave all the junk outside. Don't bring your garbage into the sanctuary. Keep your garbage outside, okay? And if you need to cleanse what the garbage has spoiled, right here at the altar. This is, this is your living fountain right here. Come right here. And you begin to weep and praise God and ask God for help and God, whatever you're going through, and you know what? That would save a pastor a lot of counseling time. Amen? Okay, just let me uh, finish this here. The Davidic covenant. He will uh, be great, and he will be called the son of the highest, and the Lord will give him a throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. You find that in Luke 1, 32 to 33. And this verse must be interpreted in respect to the promise of the Davidic covenant. And this promise is basically fourfold in relating to, number one, a seed, a house, a throne, and a kingdom. The verses in Luke prophesied this for the fourfold promise would find its fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ, the son of David. So we're going to end there. So there are two aspects to the covenants that God makes. What are they? Two aspects. Many covenants, but two aspects. Conditional and unconditional or called the bilateral or the unilateral covenants. Got that? Okay, let's close. Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. God, teach us, Lord, how to understand these things, Father, and apply these things to our heart and to our life so that we walk in covenant relationship with you. And that, Father, we will receive the benefits and the promises, God, and the, and the, and the um, stature of it, Father, and, and being positioned in it because of Christ. 
and because of our willingness to submit to you. So, Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for those who listened. Thank you for, you, for those who are on Facebook. We ask your blessing upon them tonight. And we give you the praise, honor, and glory for giving us illumination and revelation in your word. And we give you the thanks. And all the glory goes to you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Good night. Thank you.